Hello and welcome to the Old Man Orange Podcast. I'm Spencer Scott Holmes, bringing you another Old Man Orange Presents via VHS episode. One of them from the rarities vault that we have from back in the day that just never got put out. So come join us for another fun-filled retro movie review. Let's jump on in. So welcome to another episode of the Via VHS Retro Movie Podcast. I'm Wesley, and as always, I'm joined by Spencer Scott Holmes. And last week we went down to the crossroads, and uh, we danced with the devil a little bit, not in the pale moonlight, but to the blues. And um, it was fun. We kind of just tiptoed. We just kind of like stuck our toes into the, you know, the eternal realm of hell. And this week we're going balls deep. We're on the highway to hell. Um, and that's what we're discussing this week. Not the great, um, ACDC album from, I think it was like 1976. Yeah. Or 70, I think it's 79. It's the last, uh, Bon Scott album. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. And, Damn. uh, yeah, that, that, that's one of those albums. that's like pure, well, pretty much all ACDC is pure amazing from beginning to end, but that album right there is super fantastic. Hmm. I would hear this. That's a uh, Spencer Scott Holmes. You're hearing right there and seeing if you're watching this on YouTube or, or Spotify. And I think you could watch it on anchor now too. I think the anchor actually lets you watch the podcast now too. So we're in three places for yes. video View, viewing pleasure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Been um, getting my, been working on the set a little bit. I got some, a few new things to add cleaned up in here today. Made it nice. It smells fancy. Ooh, I like that part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm pumped, and we got just a few more things to add to the background, and it's going to be looking kind of swanky, but I'm I'm pumped about it. I mean, you, you got those posters for days that you could coat walls. I mean, you're probably like me, where you have so many posters that you could probably coat about three houses worth of walls. Oh, God, yeah. Well, I have all those posters, and then I have, if you remember at the last house I was at on the set, that had those framed posters that were above the vhs it was like india like back uh, to the future yeah raiders the thing i still got those i reframed them actually and they're kind of so i'm trying to find a spot for those and my rolling stones in slash mtv banner flag so we got some cool stuff nice, going nice. on. But if you're listening to this this is that's totally irrelevant to you because you can't see it so but you can I imagine guess, uh, it yeah you can you know imagine I mean? it yeah but sometimes imagining it that's the way to go. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you chose this movie where you were, we're going to, the, I, I didn't know a damn thing about it. No, no, Never nobody really it. does. This is a very lost movie. This is one of those ones to me. Highway to hell is one of those like ultimate childhood classics that goes along the same lines as maximum overdrive, which ironically that has the ACDC soundtrack. And this one wanted to have an ACDC soundtrack, but they couldn't afford it. So they got this kind of different kind of, you know, 80s, you know, new wave rock thingy-majig going on there, which I can see where that was kind of like a bummer to not have the ACDC. But at the same time, that music is very iconic to me coming into this picture mm-hmm. just because it takes me back. But what this yeah, movie I, was... understandable. Yeah. But what this movie really was, just kind of going to it, is like, I watched it a bunch as a kid because I had a buddy who found this movie. I don't know if he found it like at the video store or something like that. And then he went on like the quest to try to find a copy of it. And it was not an easy task. You know, back in those days where like when you found a certain game or a certain like movie, and it's like, you know, you couldn't just go online and find it. You couldn't just, you know, you had to kind of search stores and just hopefully hope you ran across it at some point. And this one took him a long time. And he finally found a VHS copy of it. And then we used it for years. And this movie... Never was put on DVD for a very long time. Wasn't on Laserdisc. It wasn't even on Blu-ray till 2016. It finally came out on Blu-ray and DVD. Like this is one of those like locked to VHS movies for like ever. So like even like mm-hmm. in the 2000s when we were watching this movie, that was like the only way. So he had that VHS copy and we'd watch it like all the, the time and so on like that. And it was just one of those cool movies. And he liked anything that had cars in it. Like that was his thing. That's why Maximum Overdrive, the cars, like anything like that. Anything that had a cool mm. like hot rod in it, he was sold on the movie. You know what I mean? That, that, that was it. He was there. Yeah, this one, um, a little bit of background on this one to make it make sense. I think it, I think I looked and saw that it was a budget of $7 million and it made like $26,000. So it was definitely one of those we're hoping to make our money on home video kind of deals. But then they didn't release it for like two years. It's kind of sat on the shelf, not like at the video store, but like literally on a shelf. Like, you know, didn't see the light of day because this was all made in 1989. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I was just going to say, and then it didn't come out till video in like 92. And I think it had an extremely limited like theatrical run of probably just like a couple like real random places. And that's just enough to say yeah. you had one probably. And I, I, it, I never really saw any of the answers why the movie was kind of held back. I know there's an audio commentary. It's got a director, but this is one of those weird movies where like the director's this guy from like, um, not Belgium, but um, Holland. Ones, I think. I think. And like I looked yeah, and I looked at his thing. It's like all his movies are extremely Netherlands movies. And then he does this movie for some weird reason. And then he's back to all the Netherlands movies, like and everything else there. And then the guy who wrote it, I didn't even notice this for the longest time, but like just looking at it now, the guy who wrote it's Brian um, Hel- Helgeland or whatever. The dude who does yeah. like he's wrote like tons of big stuff. You know, one of the big ones for me and you is he did a uh, Knight's Tale, both wrote yeah. and directed and produced it, you know. But he does like Mel Gibson's payback and he does the the director's cut version that's like the hard to find version because he got mm-hmm. booted off that, that movie so he does that movie which is amazing he writes you know big movies like the postman LA confidential. he writes things like la confidential wins an academy award mystic river mm-hmm. yada 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 he's got this ginormous list um conspiracy theory like uh man on fire the take it pelham one two three the remake one so he does all this stuff nightmare on elm street uh part four even i mean that's not as big but it's still kind of a big one in like the the long run. So, I mean, even recently he did the 42 movie, you know what I mean? Mm. So it's like, this guy's got tons of stuff going to his name. And it's like, I didn't put that two, two together. They're like, Oh, that's the guy that did highway to hell. You know what I mean? Yeah. This, so that, that, <clears throat> like I said, I went to this movie completely blind. Didn't see a trailer. Didn't look at IMDb. You said we're doing highway to hell. The only research I did was trying to make sure it felt like one of those movies where there could be multiple highway to hell. So I'm like, let me make sure I'm watching yeah. the right one. But, I, you know, once I figured that out in my poster art, and when I saw the poster art, I'm like, that looks familiar. I know I've seen that on somebody's IMDb, and it turns out it was Brian Hegland's. Um, But um, that's what got my hopes so high when, you know, the at the beginning of the movie, it says written by Brian. I was like, oh, my God, Night's Tale, of course, is the first. All those things you mentioned, but, of course, Night's Tale is what I think of first because it's one of my favorite all-time movies. So I was like, pumped. Yeah. And um, yeah, this movie. Um, one the the director. What is his name again? Real quick. He's got eight, one of those really weird. Ones. It's like eight D Young or something like that. Which he, at he, first you look at it, you almost feel like he's some like you know like Asian director from like Laos or something. And that's like, oh no no no, that's yeah. not it. <laughs> that's what I was actually thinking. I was, it's, you know, yeah. But no, he's from the Netherlands. Uh, let me pull up Highway to Hell again, real quick. Yeah, Ot de Jean, He ate the dong. Um, yeah, I ate the dong. A de Jong, uh, we'll just say his name is. I don't know really how to pronounce it. It could be Ate. I have no idea. But he did do one other American movie, and it was right before Highway to Hell, and it was Drop Dead Fred. Oh, this is a, that's right. Other... I, I did see yeah. that actually when I was flipping through real quick. I was like, oh, yeah, he did do that. He also did like one Miami Vice episode, too. <laughs> Yeah, Miami Vice, and then he did Drop Dead Fred, which was for so you watch this, and I watch I watched the shit out of Drop Dead Fred. Drop Dead Fred. Phoebe Cates was probably my first like crush. I was like all about Phoebe mm-hmm. Cates, and um, yeah, it's a Drop Dead Fred, weird ass movie, very bizarre. Uh, Rick Mayo. Yeah, I haven't seen that one in a long time, but I do remember that. Yeah, that movie was so odd and. You know, you see, it does come up from time to time. It's very weird. It's kind of like a this British humor kind of vibe to it. Reminds me a lot of like the Mighty Boosh and like um. Whenever I think of like Drop Dead Fred, I always thought of um, um, Old Greg. Yes. You know, uh, yeah. And yeah, when I see I'm my downstairs, mix up. <laughs> yeah, I drink Bailey's from a shoe. You go to a club <laughs> where people wee on each other. Um, so. Yeah, that's kind of this. That's drop their friends. That kind of humor. And this one, I didn't really know what to expect when I saw, you know, the um, who wrote it. Then I went immediately. I did stop it and went, okay, let me see who directed this thing now. And then I saw Drop Dead Friend. I'm like, what am I in for here? <laughs> and it's it's like a mix between those two styles. You got some of that Drop Dead Fred, just bizarreness and kind of surrealist, kind of weird, just wacky humor and then you got some of that character developing humor that you got going on a little bit like when you have knight's tale and different things like that a lot of creativity in here it's like a poor man's beetlejuice is kind of what this movie felt like ultimately 
I mean, yeah, it's in that kind of realm because that's, I think, what makes it really interesting is it's one of those movies where it's a very mixed match of a lot of different genres in there. You know, it's got the kind of like it's horror. It's kind of an action movie. It's got comedy throughout it. It's got kind of just like inside jokes in there. But then it's got some things that are just really weird and bizarre and unanswered. And that's what, something I kind of like about it. The other thing I even kind of noticed when I was watching it this time is this is probably why I like this movie also so much. It actually reminds me a lot of the Super Mario Brothers movie at the same time, too. It's like it, those two that. movies are almost they feel very kind of similar, even just the way the kind of cars look and the chase aspects and kind of going into a different dimension and a different world to save, in a sense, the girl or the princess or whatever you want to kind of say. Like, it, I didn't, I never put those two together until I was just watching this once again. And I was like, it actually is kind of in that Super Mario Brothers movie realm. And uh, that, that probably is what adds to it for me as well. Yeah, I am. Um, I. I can see that. I could definitely see that. It, it's got that weird kind of, it's, it's it's somewhat futuristic at the same time, like the topic at the same time. Like the thing is with this movie is that it's super creative. It has a lot of ideas and a lot of different creative directions. And none of them are completely cohesive, but it's mm-hmm. like bits and pieces and moments that are really, really good in it. And it kind of drives it home. It's like, you, you get to the end of it, you're like, what did I just watch? You know, and did I enjoy it? And then I'm like, okay, I kind of did. It was it was just very, you know, bouncing around all over the place and kind of it was hard to really get a feel for it as you're watching it. You kind of had to digest it for a minute. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that was a fun little time. But, yeah, this was like, you know, you and I are always on the hunt for weird, obscure you know, bizarre movies. And this one has never crossed my path really until, you know, you mentioned it last week, <laughs> what you do it. So I'm kind of glad, I'm glad I watched it. Yeah. Well, cause it's one of those ones I do always kind of wonder. Cause it's something I've been wanting to do a podcast on forever. And really other than my one other buddy who I watched it with back in the day, I never like showed this movie to anybody else or watch it with anybody else. And I spe- always kind of wonder, you know, what, you know what you watch this as like you know a uh, eight year old or a ten year old kid or whatever the heck it was, and you could see this thing was just super cool and super amazing, and just everything about it was kind of this totally awesome. In a sense, it kind of reminded me of like where it's that thing where it's a rated R movie, but it almost feels like it's really more just like uh, a hard PG thirteen really at the end. Of the day. There's a couple things that make it just enough that it's rated R, but like for the mm-hmm. most part, I feel like it's one of those movies that does have that feel like you could kind of show it to like a kid, kind of almost the same way that sort of Army of Darkness is too. Like that movie's just borderline yeah. on the rated R ness. It's just almost it's not Evil Dead one and two. It's toned down almost enough that it realistically probably should have been a PG thirteen. You know, because it's like one of those ones like really. You're, it's, it's that kind of action with the humor and all that kind of stuff put into it and a little bit of horror and so on. But it is interesting to kind of know, like, well, what's your, you know, when you watch it when you're older, how does this movie kind of like, you know, come to someone? Yeah, this this one, it was just the whole thing was just kind of an odd experience. But it's um. so if you never heard of Highway to Hell, um, uh, 1991 or 1992 or. 89. I think most people would have probably saw it 92 if they saw it, because this is definitely not one yeah. not like hardly anybody saw it at the theaters. I'm pretty sure it was like the cast and crew that paid to go see it in the theaters. <laughs> like, and that was per- pretty much it. Um, yeah, you 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 need to have it on VHS. I feel like you you ran across this movie if you're lucky if you had one of those video stores that tried to get everything. Yeah. This was like uh, this was one of those obscure kind of like our house. You know, theaters have probably had it, too. It's just mm-hmm. not playing at your local multiplex. It's, you know, but um, Hot Way to Hell, um, we'll just say uh, 1992 for, you know, um, a consensus. But um, stars uh, Chad Lowe, uh, Rob Lowe's little brother. Uh, you got Christy Swanson, who's um, hot in everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a bunch of like semi-recognizable people except for randomly like the entire stillers are in here and i like to know the story behind that because i didn't see anything around it but ben stiller his dad his mom and his sister they're all in it yeah and like one scene and i'm like it's out of effing nowhere like is that ben stiller and then i'm like oh there's this there's jerry I'm like what is going on and then it, yeah. it, there's nothing in the trivia or anything to explain why they were there or how they got involved with this project, all of them. But it's, it's so bizarre. 
Yeah, because I remember, like, I'm because I noticed that from way back in the day, and I, my only thing I could always think of is just like maybe like the guys who put this movie together was like Ben Stiller's buddies and or you know even like family friends. And that's how they kind of got it. Cause you know, yeah, they're just all in there. And then Ben Stiller's in it twice, technically, because he also plays Genghis Khan or whatever later down the Attila. line of the bar scene. And that's Attila the Hun. Yeah, or Attila, that's who he's playing. Yeah, play Attila the Hun. And um, so he's there with his sister and everything like that. And then it's also got even other weird cameos too. Cause it's got like Lita Ford, which I kind of forgot about that, but she's like just yeah. there at the very beginning when he gets to hell. And she pretty much explains how you pretty much get here. You know, and at first it's that thing where it's like, oh, here's this industrious, like almost, almost like, you know, um, uh, a succubus kind of in a sense, but he doesn't know yeah. it yet. And then this, cr- the craziest like cook guy comes up from behind, like <laughs> too, just to, like that weird where it's creepy, weird, funny. And then you almost are not too sure all at the same time. And that's what I think I like about a lot of the stuff in here is it's like that one where it's like, you know, it's like, it's, you kind of laugh, but then you also kind of go, that's almost more creepy because it is just so weird and bizarre with some of these things that are happening. Mm-hmm. And then we got to mention that Gilbert Godfrey plays Hitler, which is amazing. Yes. <laughs> like he's he is himself like the things he says isn't funny, but his not just his voice, but his whole persona and whatever he's doing is funny. So like yeah, he's just like he's trying to convince everybody he's not really Hitler and he shouldn't be in hell, which is like <laughs> whatever that why that gag was a gag, I don't know. But he's like, the Satan's gonna call me Bob and like all these things, you know, just yelling like the parrot and Aladdin. But um, yeah, pretty much. But um, yeah. So my thought is, is that um, didn't Jerry or hit like I think Ben Stiller situation is kind of similar to Polly Shore situation where didn't the Stillers run one of the big comedy clubs? Like I know the comedy store is Polly Shore's mom, but I think they won ran one of the other ones. Like maybe like the I don't know. I'm not saying it is the Laugh Factory, but something like that. I think that they ran, which is probably why there's some other cameos in here. Yeah, I think something like that. Because I know I want to say Jerry Stiller and uh, what guy was her name? Um, Ann Maria or whatever. Um, I want to say they had a show in the 60s that turned into some kind of like stand up thing. And they probably did have some kind of club or something. Because that's sort of how it is. I know that ben, that's pretty much how Ben Stiller is. He's literally like another Polish short. Sounds weird, but. You know, he's, he's like almost the more successful Polly Shore. No matter how long, I like both of them, but that's sort of how mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, he is kind of like the more successful um, Polly Shore. So I'm trying to read it real quick if it um if I see anything like that. But I don't. But I think I've heard that somewhere. But I know, obviously, Ben Stiller was in that world. So maybe that's where how they got Gilbert Gottfried and a few others in this movie. But um. Mm-hmm. In addition to Beetlejuice, there was also kind of like Rocky Horror Picture Show kind of feel to it. Like Mm -hmm. plot wise, it was kind of there was some similarities. Um, So I'll kind of explain a little bit what it's about. So uh, the synopsis here, and it's not much. An eloping bride is taken into hell and her fiance must pursue. That's (laughs) that's synopsis somebody wrote. Um, Yeah. here's, Here's another one I'll read. Real quick, this one's a little bit too long, but it'll probably explain it better. I have no idea what I'm getting into here. It's on IMDb, written by somebody from Rio de Janeiro. So, uh, Charlie Sykes and his girlfriend Rachel Clark are traveling to Las Vegas to secretly get married to each other. It's kind of loping, but that's fine. Uh, they decide to follow through a secondary road, and while fueling their car in Sam's Last Chance gas station, they are advised by the owner and attendant Sam not to sleep after the second tree in the road is the Joshua Tree. Um, and yeah, so basically this is way too much information, but yeah, they're, they're eloping they at this diner, decided to take a back road and they're like, I think th- is she 17? Is that what's going on? Like she, it's illegal for them to be together. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be like, they can't get married in California, you know, until she's 18, but they can go to, they can go to Nevada. Right. So and, they're and on their way down. I was going to say, because you mentioned Rocky Horror, it has that feeling of like um, that these are like very like 50s kids. I know the movie's in like 1989, but it has that like it's the good old American like Norman Rockwell kids. And they just want to get married and, you know, live life to the fullest and all that kind of stuff. And it has that thing where these kind of almost just the same thing as 
Brad and Janet, like in Rocky Horror, where it's like, here's this kind of like perfect couple, but let's take them to like the bizarre, demented, dark world where, you know, everything's wrong and things are all messed up and topsy turny and see how, like, you know, see if we can break them kind of thing. It has that kind of feel because they go down the side road. I don't even know why they're going down the side road because the guy's like, you know, you can take the interstate. Nah. Well, they said they didn't want to go on the interstate because. <clears throat> um, they're afraid of the cops i guess for some well, no, reason she it was it was her, her mom because oh, yeah. so while they're in the diner the cops checking him out and charlie's all paranoid charlie's chad low and yeah. he's all paranoid about this cop looking at him and he goes because technically what we're doing is illegal and then he goes but we didn't tell anybody else and she's like well i told my mom <laughs> and she's like oh shit <laughs> so if, if mom calls the cops you know they're in deep, you know, they're fried. So they want, they decided to take the back road because he's paranoid of all these cops following them. So they said, let's just get off this road. And even when they stop, he, he tries to have sex with her in this, his Ford Pinto. And she says, no. <laughs> and, you know, the moral of the story is she should have said yes, <laughs> because, because <laughs> the Satan turns out that he's interested in her because she's a virgin, which we find out later in the film. Yeah, because so what happens is you go down this one back road and between these Joshua trees, he sucks in certain people in there, you know, never to return again. And then this is where like one of the coolest cops or one of the coolest characters, I think, in like almost any movie, but the hell cop kind of comes and he's just a police officer with a big old shaved head, but he's got all these like scars kind of looking like tattoos all around him and everything and these cool sunglasses and all this kind of almost like futuristic slash also like uh, these things like Army of Darkness type gear, like instead of having handcuffs he's just got these two like claw hands you know or like kind of like gorilla hand things that he uses to latch onto people and whatnot you know he's got a cool blast cool. it's almost like judge dread style that vaporizes people or shoots bullets or does you know whatever he wants yeah he there's a lot of subtle jokes in this movie like you know they, they're not called attention to just like do you get it do you get it they, so like that they're, his hand cuffs are literally hands they're hand cuffs you know, like mm-hmm. stupid shit like that. <laughs> um, little stuff. One of the jokes, like later in the movie, just to kind of give you an idea of the humor. They get to not to jump too far ahead, but they get to like a headquarters, I guess like Satan's headquarters. <laughs> and, and they're in a big, you know, giant Nakatomi style plaza type building. And when they go in there, there's an like apple under the glass. And there's a bite taken out of it. And it's clearly <laughs> insinuating that this is Eve's apple. Like, <laughs> like that. Yep. so it's like a really big deal, but they don't like talk about it. It's just, there's a lot of no. little jokes in there like that that are really funny. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of those things are kind of, they're just cool and interesting stuff too. It's like, it can be funny, but at the same time, I was like, well, that's kind of cool. This has got this, that in there so on like that you know and just even like i have been like just some of like just the looks of everything and stuff like when he first like the hell cop t- takes um oh uh christy swanson whatever her character's name is in and um they're at the diner that has all the ben stiller family there and whatnot and just the look of all the cops and all these like just different variations of like they're just these almost zombified and kind of monstrous looking creatures and characters inside this entire diner that's all in a sense, hell cop types guys. Yeah. It's Jerry Steeler being that, a hell cop as well. <laughs> yeah, of course. That was the scene that really reminded me of Beetlejuice because, uh-huh. you know, when it, the whole opening scene is kind of weird. Like they get off the road, they stop at this gas station, the attendants being kind of weird and creepy, but he, he knows what could potentially happen with these kids. Yeah. And so he's trying to give them all these warnings and like, hey, just stay here for the night. Don't go down there. And, um, you know, don't go down the road. And he says, I, he says something about there's two Joshua trees. Don't sleep till you get past the second one. Yeah. But of course, he falls asleep and they end up, Hell Cop abducts Rachel. And that's where he has to pursue her through hell. And he's given a bootlegger car by, um, the gas station attendant, which you don't see again later in the movie, which I thought was really disappointing. Yeah, it's kind of weird. You think there should have been a scene. There should have been one more scene towards the end where they go back to him and then they could kind of say, because big things sort of happen between that too, where like, cause, you know, when the, when he go after uh, the hell cop takes um, Christy and, you know, um, Rob, not Rob Lowe, fucking uh, 
Chad Lowe. Chad Lowe has to go bow. When he has to go back to him and ask him all the questions and so on, he goes, well, here's what happened to the helicopter. These are the people throughout the years and so on. And, you know, 1940s or whatever, when I was coming over here, he took my girlfriend and I never got her back, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And it's almost like I've been preparing for this. I've been building up. Here's my awesome car. Go in it. It's got a secret power, by the way. Shit, I forgot to tell him that. He's already gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, but she kind of like... I kind of knew what it was going to be. Like I knew, yeah. I was like, okay, this thing's got some nitrous in it, and yeah, um, turbocharged. Oh, yeah, it's really really cool. I mean, it's a really badass car. It looked like an old bootlegger. I, I'm not really good enough with cars under like this, you know, 1960s, so I can't tell you exactly what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't see it in the trivia, but. The first car was a Ford Pinto, but this one, I don't even know. <laughs> they could tell me it was anything, but um, it, it was definitely bootlegger era, but um, and it was yeah. all white, which was nice. But um, yeah, so he's got to um, go. Rachel gets abducted. He goes back to the gas station tent. He goes, oh, yeah, the hell cop got you. Yeah, well, that sucks. <laughs> and uh, gives him a gun, gives him his badass car, tells him how to get back into hell. And he does it. And the first place you go is that. Like the first really hellish place you go is that diner, and it yeah, other, really, other than Lita Ford showing up just like at the you know, oh, was that the first before? gateway. Yeah, she's there before. He's like the very first thing he runs into is like that Lita Ford scene. Oh, I thought that was after the diner. Um, but uh, yeah. So, but that diner is that's where you really get the Beetlejuice vibes, and that's where all the Steelers are. Ben's outside cooking meat on the sidewalk for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, smashing eggs on his forehead yeah it's just like, that hot out you don't need a grill <laughs> yeah he's like really trying to sell it to you like his you could tell his comedy chops aren't really fine-tuned yet i mean he's still probably on mtv at this point right this is when he was doing all the mtv shit and um, i think so it's like it, it's like and i think it's just right before that ben stiller show in like 91 I think 91, 92 is when that is, which that show has like one of the, uh, I, the intro to that show just in itself is like the most nineties feeling thing ever, you know? And it's, I can't really seem to find it too much anymore. I remember I used to just see once in a blue moon, you'd see reruns on TV, but like, I just don't see it anymore on stuff. Yeah. It was weird when he popped up. Cause this movie, I knew it made hardly any money and I was expecting like any person you saw in this to be, like Chad Lowe level, like or below, like <laughs> well, Christy Swanson level or below. Well, she was in a lot of stuff, but um, yeah, I mean, she's you know, right after this, she's in, she's you know, the very first Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and she was in that. What's that Charlie Sheen movie? Which when I was watching this, I'm like, man, this would be a good role for Charlie Sheen as Charlie in this movie. Is, is that the chase? Yeah, the chase. Uh, she's in that, yeah, that's a good movie. That, it's got Anthony Kiedis and Flea in there and uh, Henry Rollins as well, too. There's, there's all kinds of people in that film. Yeah, she, she's in a, on a lot of really good things. There's one big one I'm not thinking. Oh, Ferris Bueller. She's got a small part in that. But um, play the flowers in the attic thing. Ugh, goodness, flowers in the attic. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, so basic, basically this hell is very surreal it's not like, you know, oh, you're in a burning pit of flames and whatever. But Satan later explains that because you do meet Satan later on in the movie. But um, there's different kind of realms to hell. But this one's kind of more of a bizarre. You're in the desert, but there's random diners and hangouts and stuff like you got Jimmy Hoffa's place, <laughs> which was pretty funny. Yeah. Well, it- well, it's almost like it's like hell if, if hell kind of took place like on Route 66 and just like the middle of like New Mexico kind of feeling Perfect, like that's yeah. sort of like what this because like a lot of the stuff in this one is that kind of 1950s road movie and that kind of vibe mixed in with like this hellish and, you know, kind of like creature effects and all kinds of stuff like that. It, it's an interesting kind of combo there, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this movie has a lot of stuff going on, too. Like, there's this whole other gang uh, with this character named Royce. And Mm -hmm. that was probably my biggest problem with this movie is because you could have left that gang out for pretty much. And it it wouldn't have affected the movie at all. Like, you could have just completely written them out. Um, But that is where Clara is, is, though. 
Yeah, who's the gas station attendant's like, you know, old girlfriend from way back in the day. And she would, you know, well, she's kind of the pivotal thing. You need her because she explains a handful of the stuff as it goes down. I feel like that gang is almost supposed to be there just to be annoying and kind of in the way. Like, it's just like the chaos of when you go to hell. This is part of it. It's like they don't really serve a purpose necessarily, but they're just getting in your way on your trying to get the progress of, you know, getting out of here. Yeah, the Satan kind of alludes to Royce. It, Satan later says he's a huge disappointment. And Satan has this other kid, which we'll talk about in a minute, named Adam. And it's not that Adam. Mm-hmm. But he said he says he's raising him up to be something. He's going to send him to Earth later, which is really ominous. So it's basically saying, like, well, I raised Hitler here for a while. <laughs> then I raised, <laughs> you know, all these horrible people. And this is my next one. Um. Yeah. Which if they ever revi- if this movie would ever became big and they made a sequel, I'm sure they would have built it around that. Him being maybe the Antichrist or something. But um Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> a lot of weird little well, it... Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that that little kid almost has like that total like Anakin Skywalker kind of vibe where he's just <laughs> the nicest, friendliest kid on the planet, you know, and then it's just like you know that he's just gonna turn at some point and become the guy terrorizing everybody else (laughs) yeah yeah it's um they're gonna you know he it says at the end of the movie he goes and lives with his aunt and uncle in cleveland because they break him out of hell spoiler alert Mm -hmm. and um i bet they're gonna start seeing like skinned cats and stuff on their porch (laughs) and stuff at a certain point in time (laughs) and the kids you know, the main character is Charlie. So the kids in the backseat, like, go faster, Charlie. <laughs> he doesn't have a British accent, but I'm just picturing Charlie from the YouTube <laughs> stuff. It's, oh, you bit me, Charlie. So, um, but yeah, the kid's kind of fucking annoying. <laughs> well, like, I feel like he's just supposed annoying. to be, I think that the way he's almost put in the movie is just like, you have this ridiculously friendly child who's you know like the nicest kid known to mankind and he he's living with satan in a sense yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I think that's kind of what it's going for you know and it, it is a little bit goofy because you know he's kind of there for probably a little bit longer than he needs to sort of be it could have been like hey you know whatever i'll save you i'll see you in a bit though <laughs> yeah man time let me, let, yeah. let me get some stuff taken care of hold on to the dog for me for a second there's a lot of back and forth in this movie it's just not like it could have been this could have been a really, really good movie. And it's a good movie, but it could have been a lot better. But um, yeah, that whole kid situation goes back and forth, Royce's gang, and then you're bouncing the hell cop back and forth throughout the movie. It's just kind of like this happens, this happens, this happens. Oh, this is happening again. And it's just this kind of like off and on journey that you're going on. But mm-hmm. one of the other main characters that you meet is um what what's his name? Beza, Bilzis, um, Beazle? Beazle, which yeah. I knew right away. I'm like, oh, Beelzebub. He's like, this guy's going to be Satan. And I think even on the side of his truck, it said something like. Um, it's a satanic uh, mechanic. Yeah, satanic mechanic, which I thought was pretty clever. But um, this guy's kind of helping Charlie throughout the movie. He even get like Charlie gets straight up shot at one point and is like dying. And then he fucking ETs his ass back to life. <laughs> but um and it, the motivation for it's kind of unclear like what satan's trying to do this whole movie it's except for with rachel he's trying to fuck her because she's a virgin yeah <laughs> and he wants to make another satan baby but yeah his motivation with charlie is kind of weird like just make yeah. him die <laughs> you know yeah, well, I feel it's, it's that weird thing where it's just like, I want him to have this weird hope that I can break as it keeps going on. Like, it's like, that's what he finds interesting. It's like, I'm going to help this guy, make him think he's making progress throughout this journey, but like, I'm going to put things in the way for him. I'm going to be sort of part of the problem, but he's not going to know it for a long time. And that's almost just his weird little thing that he's into. It's just when you got that kind of time in hell, you can do that sort of stuff. Yeah, I wish that was a little bit clearer because he does talk about will a lot, um, like your free will. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that had something to do with Charlie, why he couldn't kill him and why he couldn't, you know, maybe that's just uh, he's kind of inhibited. But I mean, the the plot is kind of secondary. This thing is really just about jokes. There's a lot of visual gags. 
subtle gags in here. And it is really, really funny, but it's, it is kind of, it's just like a, it's a kind of a, a little bit of a Beetlejuice is really what it is. Just a kind of, but on the road, but it has that Mm -hmm. you're in another world. You're in another place in time there in hell. It's, or at least like a purgatory type situation. And everything's like really creepy, but in a very funny kind of like, you know, tongue in cheek kind of way. Yeah, well, that's the thing, too, because it's just got so much cool, you know, visual effects in this movie, so much cool creatures, you know, makeup, you know, characters. And I think that's some of the other stuff, too. It's got cool matte paintings and designs. And, you know, it, it, yeah, Very it's cool definitely on the low budget for some of the stuff. But there's so many things in this movie that I just like, gosh, I love that. The car designs, too, like the Hellcops car, like everything about the Hellcop. That's uh, to me is, I think, one of the coolest characters. Like that guy can even appear in more stuff. And I think that would be amazing to see, you know. Just even the he's just watching a movie where the hell cop sort of you know was the guy who was like the star, and you sort of just watch through his kind of like eyes things and everything like that. You followed that character around would be interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. <clears throat> I I would have I wouldn't mind seeing this remade. Honestly, this is a perfect candidate. Like when we talk about movies being remade, this is like the perfect kind of movie because it had a really cool concept. It was kind of disappointing box office doesn't it's a cult following, but not a massive cult following. So you have something and people are going to think it's new and original and completely unique for for most people. But it, you know, this is this is the kind of films that I think need to be remade. And I would like to see a big budget go in it and some decent actors like a Tom Holland or something playing Charlie's role or something like that, you know. Tom Holland, Daisy Ridley, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, even though you, you almost need characters that are younger, because Tom Holland's almost like he's like pushing thirty on this. Well, yeah, you I know, need, I know, you I know he looks kind of like a boy. Day. You know, but yeah. this is one of those movies where you need like a director, like a like literally like a, the best way I can say is like someone like a Robert Rodriguez who could take this movie, mm-hmm. understand it, and still give it its grindhouse kind of elements to it, and it's you know over the top you know, make it even more, you know, kind of rated R and violent and so yeah. on. And it could be, you know, as I'm wrong, I love the movie just as is, but I know that's probably more, a little bit more nostalgic. It just t- always takes me back when I watch it and I can just kind of remember there's something just special about it and everything there, but it has such an amazing concept. I mean, it's a simple concept, like go to hell, rescue your girlfriend, but like the cool characters, the way you're treating it with like a kind of like a, a racing movie. Cause that's almost the thing too, is if you even, you know, put even more car stuff in it like this is one of those movies that which would be hard to do nowadays because it feels like car movies are kind of almost few and far between because you can't really do the same kind of stunts that you once could but you know giving it like a hardcore like you know just really focus on the cars even more in it you know because i mean it has Mm -hmm. that sort of mad max thing even though it's doing its own thing for sure but there's something to be said about having you know, even more cars put into it and so on. I do like how, like, when they do show, like, the whole cars, everybody going to the River Sticks, they're all driving Volkswagens. <laughs> like, that's the car. Are you going to hell in? <laughs> so, funny, funny story. I have, like, uh, my, my grandparents loved Volkswagen Beetles. And on their property, um, we did, my grandparents have both passed now, but um, my, my uncle still lives out there and um, uncle jody there's your uncle jody reference mm-hmm. and they still have all those volkswagen beetles um <laughs> and they're just in the same shape that they were in when they stopped driving because they're always going to fix them up and like i've been given two of them and i'm like <laughs> i have to do so much work to to get them on the road yeah but um like there's even one my mom flipped at one point in time when well, no, she oh, didn't geez. actually j- Jody, my uncle Jody flipped. They were on the way to school and Jody was driving uh-huh. and flipped it. He was turning something on the radio. I always want to imagine it was the Eagles because I think a big Lebowski is like, I hate the Eagles. And he was trying to turn it. I hate the, the fucking Eagles. Yeah, I hate the fucking Eagles. Probably wasn't, but <laughs> he was, yeah, he was turning the radio, went off the road. Instead of like riding back onto the road, he jerked the vehicle. And if you, if you see a Volkswagen Beetle, they're like made to flip. Like that's what, yeah. that's what they look like they're gonna do, um, and he he tumbled it several times, and th- th- it almost <laughs> killed my mom. But what saved her life was the door, 
and leaned back on the door and used it as a kickstand. And the door was really? all crumpled. Yeah. Yeah. The door was all crumpled in and my mom woke up and the car was above her and it, it was just leaning enough on the, on the door to not crush her. Oh, and it's still, it's still there. It's still like that. The door is still crumpled in. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's been 40, that's been like 40 some odd years now. It's still just there. Same way. Isn't that weird? All, all, all these. All these Volkswagen Beetles just sitting there, hanging out, God, waiting for somebody. Yeah. Waiting for something. I have a. I need to have a lot of time, money, and a lot of motivation to even think about those Volkswagen Beetles. But when I saw those Volkswagen Beetles going down the road, I'm like, "That is hell. That's hell." <laughs> like being stuck <laughs> that, in traffic. That is. All Beetles. <laughs> it's all, all Beetles. Yeah, there's. I feel like that's even like that's gotta be like kind of like a Holland joke right there too. Even like that seems like one of those ones. The you're right next to Germany, all those Beetles and so on like that. You're one hundred percent right. La- there, there's more layers to that scene than uh, we would even think in like America. <laughs> I think you're one hundred percent right. Yeah, was, but they're just they're they're so unique looking but they were pieces of shit like the other one and the other one my grandparents had literally caught on fire while they were driving it <laughs> yeah like he just caught on fire my papa was like yeah hey, i'm gonna fix that one too but she could have yeah but yeah didn't. no yeah you you, you oh, gotta man. be super into it to be uh putting that all back together and so on <sighs> fucking engine in the back and trunk in the front so weird yep. <laughs> um but yeah, anyway, but yeah, so they're trapped in hell with Volkswagen Beetles in like LA traffic and they're like all trying to wreck each other, of course. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of little subtle jokes like that and little things that happen like so quick that I wish, you know, it could have been elaborated on more. Like honestly, if this movie had been written really well and like really tight, they could have used an extra half an hour and expanded on some of the scenes. Because certain things go by so fast that you don't really like. There's a scene where he's got to cross the river. Yeah, and he talks to this guy like he's he's like, um, um, are you you're you know you're not dead. You can't come go on this river. He's like, well, yeah, I kind of want to go anyway. He's like, okay, I'll let you. <laughs> so, and <laughs> then he does it. And he goes through his tunnel and cave and all this stuff. Lets him off, and I'm like, well, that whole scene was pointless. But if you would elaborate on that made a whole gag out of it yeah then it could have been well, really and i good. think you know i think that's just some of the low budget nature of it i think you, you could tell like this would be interesting this is one of those ones would be interesting to read what the original script probably was because mm. i feel it's oh, one yeah. of those movies where it's it's definitely one of those ones where it's like hey cool script but let's be honest like th- this is what we got to kind of you know cut down and do and so on not like many scripts you know but uh, I bet you is one of those ones where it probably was a little bit more elaborate. And then you had to kind of be realistic after a while and say, hey, this is what we can and can't do and kind of go with it. And it still gets a lot of stuff across for like, you know, a B movie. There still is some pretty impressive stuff going on in this film. You know, it's one of those ones where there is still some neat sets and still some elaborate designs and so on that they have. It does go by kind of, a, you know, kind of quick. Like it's like like many of these movies, like you got such a cool world. You do need like, it would be nice to have about an extra 20 minutes to really expand on it. Yeah. And this, it, they're very limited. You can tell, like you're saying, but it's like, you know, Brian Hagelin's a great writer, probably, probably had a lot of really funny, clever ideas or maybe more time with characters and to build motivations and stuff. And it's just like, we ain't got time for that, bro. Fit in as many yeah. visual gags as you can, which they did. They shoved a lot of little quick side gags on there. Yeah. To, to kind of and, make up for it. But go ahead. I was going to say it's that. And, I, and I, I just do like, I like just some of the chaos and kind of weird scenes that are in there that are sort of unexplained. Sometimes I think sometimes like having an unexplained scene and just have it keep passing on is kind of cool. Like something there it leaves you to sort of think like, well, what was that just all about? And then it, the, the movie just keeps playing on. It doesn't stop to go like, let's go back to that real quick. No, no, just mm-hmm. just have it go. Have our character keep you know pushing forward and don't worry about that. Yeah, I think because they are trying to make it very surreal. And there's a little bit more of a cerebral element to this movie that I think more people give it credit for. But there's a lot of like... You know, hell is weird. It's bizarre. It's it's mm-hmm. a mind fuck. I think the one thing that they could have done in this movie to make it even more suspenseful throughout 
is at the beginning of the movie, he's given that teddy bear clock. And in hell itself, you know, they, they mentioned while they're down there, the time moves differently and things are very odd. And you could tell he's down there for longer than the, a lot of time, but on earth before he goes there, he is told, I think I have to wrap it up. Okay. Well, that's okay. We're, we're getting close to the end anyways. So mm-hmm. I think that's kind of good. What was I talking about? You know, I don't really remember, but I, I, in the time you were gone, I found that there's some other kind of interesting things. The dude that was uh, at the River Sticks telling um, telling uh, Peter or whatever, you know, Rob Lowe's brother, that he can't go down there. That's the Predator. Mm-hmm. What? The, yeah, the dude in the suit, the Kevin Peter Hall. Apparently that's Predator. And then I was looking at uh, the CJ Graham, the dude who plays Hell Cop. He played uh, Jason in Friday the 13th Part 6. He looks and like he's he also in the Alice him. Cooper music music video for the you know the man behind the mask song for that that it was you know was that attached to this movie? No, what what the the Alice Cooper song? Yeah, no, that's for Friday the Thirteenth Part Six. Oh, oh, I see what you're, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But he he was the Jason in the music video in that one too. Yeah, I was, was like, I said I was just kind of looking at some of these other characters, and then I was looking, I was like, even like a. Um, or no, that's the different character I was thinking. I mean, one of these other ones, yeah, some or another, but yeah, there's some interesting things I was just kind of looking at while I was sort of flipping through just some of the other characters. So it actually is kind of like you know, it's impressive at just how many other kind of uh actors and stuff there is in the background of this movie because this movie has that feeling like you know it would just be kind of a small you know group of things but it's just like oh there is like when you look at like the list of people you know maybe like at first glance you might not recognize their names but then it's like you oh shit these people are in like all kinds of stuff so it it has that kind of feeling of like almost um that kind of thing where a bunch of guys who are already on the sets of big movies kind of go hey you know what let's get together and make our own movie over here you know what i mean Probably, I think this was actually, I read, I think this was Kevin Peter Hall's last movie. I think this was yeah, last I think I saw he, that somewhere too. Because he died April 10th, 1991. Yeah, I, I think I saw that as well. I think that was almost in like the trivia section or something, but. Oh, he died of AIDS. I didn't know that. No, oh, I didn't know that either. Um... Anyway, not to break it down, but yeah, there's there's a lot of little interesting side characters and stuff in here. Just like a very kind of like a eclectic group of people that kind of brought this together. Bigger names than you would imagine for something that's kind of like really low budget, really unknown. And it has developed somewhat of a cult following, but I feel like that's always kind of said about any movie that's just kind of had a resurgence of any type. But I don't yeah. think this one has like a cult following like some other movies do. I feel like there needs to be some type of classification to that because it's <laughs> like you know, there's like a group of people that like it. That's not a cult following. You know what I mean? That's like, yeah, you know, I think that's more because I've literally in my entire life, I've never ran across somebody else who like brings this movie up and talks about it. Like that's one of those ones that's just like, you know, it was me and one other guy was the only people I ever knew that ever watched this movie and really dug it and, you know, everything about it. Like it's, it's really, I'll say it has like, it's like that thing where it's like, I could see where it could become a cult movie, but like, let's be honest. I feel like a cult movie is when it's kind of like popular and all that kind of stuff. This movie just feels like it's still just sort of lost in time. Like it was re-released mm-hmm. on Blu-ray and DVD, and you know, for I felt like all the people that had the VHS or taped off TV copies were the people that bought those Blu-rays and DVDs. Let's be honest. I think it's like the same people just buying their movie over again. Yeah, I think sometimes there's just like anybody who owns the rights to something, like, hey, it's got a cult following now. But um, hmm. yeah, I think they taught they toss that word around a little too much, you know. I think so too, but this, I mean, this movie is on right now. It's on Tubi. You can watch it if you've never seen it, if you can endure the commercials. I rented it on Vudu, but um, it's, it is findable. It's not like other things that we've watched where we couldn't find it. Yeah. You know, this one, at least you can, you know, there's a clear ownership of it and you can go out there and you can find copies of it and actually watch it. Yeah, it's one of those ones. It's like once they put it out back on DVD in 2016 and the Blu-ray one, it became a lot more easier to find. Because before, when it was just lo- it was just that 1992 VHS release, and that was it. 
the movie was, I think that's just the thing is like, it just was not a common one. It probably wasn't, you probably couldn't just go down to like, you know, a normal store and buy it. You really had to go like out of your way and find it or, you know, import it or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, this is an obscure one. I'm, I recommend it. I think it's a fun time. I think it's, it's a clever vision is you got a director that's not super well known, but he did two. He did drop dead Fred, which a lot of people that that movie does have a cult following. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you like drop dead Fred, the, you, this is not very similar, but you know, this is another piece of work you can see by the same guy. And then if you like night's tale or something like that, or just Brian Hegelin in general, there's, there's something to take away from this, but you know, it's just kind of a weird romp and the concept is so cool that it's worth revisiting. It is. I, I can't help but think of what if with this movie, mm -hmm. like if it was really given, like if it really had attention from a studio and really, really backed it, what it could have been. I've got some bigger names in there a little bit. And I think they could have done something really, really big with this. Yeah. It, well, it's definitely one of those ones. The concepts out of this world, you know, for me, no matter what, like when I watch it, it just gives me all the nostalgic feelings. It takes me back in time. You know, I can almost just see the VHS spinning around and watching it and so on. And just this very cool hidden gem experience you know, and uh, I just always love it. I love, I love the aesthetic of this. It, this, it's right in that, like almost like my favorite time period, where all the sounds, all the looks, everything like that. That late '80s, early '90s era. You know, it just hits all the right notes for me, and it can always take me back. And I think this one's an amazing one that people should definitely check it out if you like anything kind of in like horror action. You know, cars with the comedy in there too, and just a fun, wild, weird ride you know of cool effects and all kinds of fun stuff like that but it's not really for everybody i will say at the same time you you got to be kind of into this kind of world i think there's enough interesting little tidbits attached to it that if you're really into movies i think this is one worth definitely watching just if anything for just the cameos and just um you know what is this weird little thing who how did they get all these people and you know, I won't say A-listers, but recognizable known people into this like completely forgotten movie. Um, so yeah, Highway to Hell. It's on Tubi. You can rent it pretty much anywhere. Uh, I think it's been on. I think I read it has been on Amazon a few times too. Usually, if something's been on Tubi, it's been on Amazon or vice versa. Yeah, it was on Amazon at once when we 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 thought about doing this movie. I don't know, like a year or two before. You know, and then of course you can buy the Blu-ray or DVD. I got that on Amazon. There you go. Well, I've already been interrupted a couple of times by a child screaming for daddy um, to come rescue him from his nightmares. Because real funny thing, real quick, um, my mm -hmm. kid who for some reason has always been interested in ghosts and like spooky things and like like Halloween's his, his shit. Right. And uh -huh. never been able to get him into any movies that are like contemporary, like live action. Like I've tried yeah. to get him on Star Wars, try to get him on things. If he's tired enough, I'll sit down and watch something with me, but he's not really interested in it. But he's heard the Ghostbuster song, got into that. And this kid has literally been watching all the Ghostbusters movies. There we go. That That's at least a good start. I'm I'm pumped. I did not think that was going to be the gateway. I did not <laughs> think that was going to be. I did not think Gozer was going to open the gates and send him through there. But alas, um, but it's also probably giving him nightmares. <laughs> so I'm trying to like temp, <laughs> temper that. But he's like all day long. If there's something strange in the neighborhood, like all day long, <laughs> like <laughs> like just yeah, who, who's he going to call? The Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, he'll just say that randomly. He'll just look at who are you gonna call. I'm like Ghostbusters. He's like, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That, that's <laughs> so, probably that's Ghostbusters. Probably a much better one. I mean, you know, probably at that same age when I would have watched Ghostbusters, I would also watch Night Living Dead, and uh, yeah, that one had an interesting effect on like a six year old. <laughs> yeah, well, he's only three and a half. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess so. that's, that's that's not that too. He's even no. younger. <laughs> yeah, he's. He's three. He uh, he's he just basically right at three and a half years old. So, 
a little young for some of that stuff, which is why I don't push the live action stuff on too hard. Like you'll get into Star Wars and stuff eventually, hopefully. Now my little one is going to watch whatever with me. He's just kind of chill and watch a movie kind of kid. But um, yeah, but yeah, so there's some spooky stuff going on at this house too. But um, anyway, never seen Highway to Hell. Definitely watch it. Definitely worth it. I had fun with it. I'm glad I've seen it. I'm glad we reviewed this one because this is definitely in our wheelhouse. I think of the kind of stuff that we like to talk about on this movie, um, on this podcast is kind of forgotten movies like this that have a lot of unique elements that tie it to bigger things and more well-known things. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, you know, it's one that actually, there's one more point I want to make on, you know, what's another thing that's a really cool effect in this movie is the Cerberus dog. They got in the stop motion animation. Yes. That thing, I, I, I kind of forgot about that, too. And right when it popped up, I'm like, oh, yeah, they got this really awesome stop motion animation Cerberus dog they run across right before he goes to the river Styx. Because it sort of combines, like, it's like everything of hell, you know, whether it has Greek mythology and whether it has, you know, even Norse and, you know, just Christian hell and all that different stuff. It's kind of cool. It's like, well, I'm like, yeah, Cerberus is in there. And it's just an awesome stop motion animation, like totally at like the tail end where very few movies are ever doing stop motion animation by this point. You know, I mean, you got army of darkness, mm-hmm. of course, coming up right here at the, right around the corner, but yeah, you got, um, it's amazing to me that Jurassic park was going to be that technology. <laughs> it was going to be stop God, motion. I, I, I love that. That footage that they have is so cool. Like in the special features of Jurassic park, mm-hmm. like I almost wish somebody would just edit that footage in there. Like, like even finish and complete all that and just have a movie where plays the same and then all of a sudden it cuts to like stop motion animation just just why not because it looks so cool <laughs> yeah want to feel old that movie's 30 this year i know gosh that that's it's one of those ones and boy i saw that in the theaters you know right when it came on out me too me too golly well um anyway thanks for listening go check out highway to hell and I, I promise next week we'll not have any directional hell-based um, movies. We're not taking a, a road, a boulevard, a <laughs> interstate, or anything to hell next week. We're not going to be at the crossroads or the corner of hell or anywhere. <laughs> we're, we're not going to hell next week. I promise. Um, so anyway, um, anything, any last things you want to mention before we get out of here? Um, as I said, I probably mentioned this on one of the last ones, but that Pizza Boys issue is literally done. So I'm going to be sending that thing off to get printed like all this in like the next uh, couple days and get that all going, get the digital version up and all that good stuff. But uh, Pizza Boys issue 13, Kung Fu Adventures coming at you hardcore pretty darn soon. Mm, Kung Fu Adventures. We should do something similar to that to celebrate the release of... Uh... The upcoming Pizza Boys. But anyway, thanks for listening. Y'all have a good one. Catch us on the highway to hell. And via VHS is out.